Welcome everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure today to have Professor Gavin Schmidt uh, from uh, GIST, uh, New York. Gavin is uh, a worldwide expert of climate change and uh, his research is simulation of uh, climate. He has authored more than 150 papers and books. Uh, you can look up his TED Talk if you want to uh, learn more about this art. Uh, and in 2021, he was the senior climate advisor to NASA. So, uh, Dr. Schmidt, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, one, one comment about questions. If you have questions throughout the talk, please put them in the chat. And when, uh, when Gavin is done speaking, we will go to the questions and, and uh, answer them one by one. So please put the questions in the chat. Gavin, it's yours. Thank you very much, Antonella. It's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and uh, th th there's uh, a great audience already. And so uh, I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be able to share this uh, with you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, climate change from space. Um, this is one of the uh, unique parts of working for NASA is that, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we have, you know, all, all, of, the, all of the information uh, that comes from, from the remote sensing, we have the models to understand it, we have the, um, uh, the imperative to uh, help people understand what it all means, um, and that is, uh, you know, the a very uh, broad portfolio. Uh, and so I'm trying to give you a, here a, uh, a hint of what we can see uh, from climate change directly uh, from space uh, and then how we interpret it and what that all means. Okay. Uh, so uh, the NASA Earth fleet uh, is, uh, is, is is quite uh, broad. I think this is slightly out of date. I think there's a couple of, of new ones that have come in here. Um, they cover instruments that are in low Earth orbit um, in uh, Lagrange point uh, one. Uh, there are instruments on the International Space Station. Um, uh, and we have uh, a lot of uh, other things that are going on. And obviously uh, there are uh, European and Japanese and Indian partners uh, with a lot of these uh, with a lot of these things, but but it gives us a sense uh, of what it is that we can measure, which is not everything. Um, we can discuss what we're not measuring uh, later on, uh, but it does give us a very uh, comprehensive view of, uh, of 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 what's happening right now. Um, and I will show you is actually given us a view over what's happened uh, over over decades as well. So what are the what are the first observations that we make? Um, we, we can take, uh, you know, uh, this is false color image um, of, uh, of ice on the planet uh, and pretty much anywhere where there is ice, there has been retreat. Uh, so this is a uh, this is an image taken from Landsat uh, in 1989. Uh, and so now we are more than 30 years later. This is the Columbia Glacier in, in Alaska. Uh, there's been radical changes uh, in, in the last uh, 30 years. And we can see this, you know, pretty much everywhere uh, we look. Um, uh, one of the neatest things that we're measuring uh, is gravity. So, and the changes of gravity uh, through the uh, the grace, the grace follow-on, and uh, uh, and the planned um, gravity missions uh, that are part of the uh, Earth uh, Earth Observatory system that we're that we're putting together, uh, and they show us very clearly uh, that Antarctica and Greenland are losing ice mass. That ice mass is moving into the ocean at the rate of around 150 gigatons uh, per year in Antarctica and about 280 uh, gigatons per year of water in Greenland. Um, and this is uh, enough now to be uh, roughly a, a millimeter uh, per year of sea level rise um, and, uh, and, and is continuing to, uh, to affect sea level um, uh, around the world. Uh, we are measuring 
uh, the sea ice changes. The sea ice changes. We've lost, as we as as we're aware, in in uh, in the Arctic, uh, we've lost about forty percent of the uh, summertime uh, ice. Uh, and even in winter, we've lost almost 10 percent of the uh, of the ice and uh, uh, in all the other seasons, but we're losing ice as well um, in Antarctica, which I haven't got a picture for. Um, we just seen the last two years have been the lowest uh, Antarctic sea ice on record, which is a little bit more confusing because uh, up until 2015, uh, the ice in uh, Antarctica was slightly increasing. And so uh, there's been a very rapid shift in that uh, over the last uh, over the last couple of years, um, we can put that together with the altimetry data. So uh, the altimetry data is a direct measure of uh, the sea level, um, and with the series of uh, of four uh, and uh, and I think uh, yeah five now the uh, the Sentinel six uh, Mike Freilich satellite, uh, we can see uh, this this ongoing and accelerating uh, rate of global mean uh, sea level rise. Uh, adding all of those things together, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, uh, and uh, we also put together uh, measurements uh, from the surface. So this is not directly from space. This is from uh, in situ surface uh, measurements of uh, from weather stations, uh, um, uh, ocean uh, ship measurements, buoy measurements, uh, the Argo float measurements, and, uh, and historically, uh, you know, XB, XBTs and, and other kinds of measurements in the ocean. Um, and what we find is that since the late 19th century, the planet has warmed about 1.2 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, it was uh, it's kind of slow to get going. It warmed up to the 1940s. There was a bit of a plateau through to the 1970s. But since the 1970s, there's been a steady and perhaps accelerating uh, increase in uh, global mean temperature. Um, uh, and that's uh, that's extremely worrying because you can see that even though that seems like it's a small number, one degree Celsius, right? That's not that's not a big number. We can see that it's already having impacts on uh, biospheres, on ice, uh, on sea level. Uh, so for the planet itself, uh, this is not a negligible number by any stretch of the imagination. We can also use the satellites to track temperature, right? So the surface temperatures I'm showing there, that's the bottom at the red. Uh, we predicted uh, as a community, uh, we predicted in the 1960s uh, that one of the main effects of carbon dioxide increases uh, on the planet would be this strange vertical fingerprint where we had stratospheric, mesospheric, cooling um, uh, while the surface and the troposphere would warm. And those were predictions made in the 1960s. And uh, uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize for Physics was uh, was given to, uh, in part, to Suki Manabe, who was part of those predictions uh, for a paper that he wrote in 1967, before we had any satellite emission, uh, any satellite records of what was going on in the upper atmosphere. And so you can see uh, these are different uh, levels of the of the of the atmosphere and you can see that the upper levels above the tropopause have been cooling um, uh, and the higher you go the more they've been cooling and that, that continues into the mesosphere and thermosphere um, and uh, and below the tropopause in the troposphere at the surface in the lower troposphere in the mid troposphere uh, we're seeing uh, increasing signs of warming um, we're also seeing in these records uh, evidence for the impacts of volcanoes uh, particularly El Chichon and Pinatubo uh, in 1982 and 1991, respectively. Uh, and the impacts of El Nino's, uh, we can see um, in 1998, there was a very strong El Nino, uh, 2010, 2016, and perhaps again in 2024, if you're looking at the uh, tendencies in the tropical Pacific right now, uh, it looks like the last three years, which have been uh, La Nina years, are now shifting over to to an El Nino, uh, which is a, a, a warmer phase uh, for, the, uh, for the surface temperatures across the whole planet. So how do we deal with this? How do we, how do we understand the processes? How do we understand why things are changing? Uh, 
Uh, and so that requires uh, models. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we do at GIS is create these models. Um, uh, these, uh, the process of building these models and updating these models is, you know, you basically start with the observed uh, structure. Um, the, 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 just there was a, a comment in the chat about the presentation not beginning. Can people see my presentation? Yes. Okay. We, yes. we can. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> that was just a little concerning. <laughs> um, uh, we start with uh, the observations of, of the basic uh, climate system. Where are their continents? Where are their mountains? Uh, what kind of uh, surface type uh, do you have? Where are the lakes? Where are the uh, where you know where where are, where are all the other things? Uh, we build those in. We build in uh, the emissions, the atmospheric concentrations of uh, of various things. Um, and then we develop parameters, uh, parameterizations. You know, we the, the models embed uh, concepts like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of mass. Uh, but there are lots of things that are smaller than the resolved scale of these models where we have to build parameterizations. And those involve uh, clouds, uh, uh, mixing in the boundary layer, um, surface heterogeneity, where we're not really capturing everything that's going on. Uh, and those, uh, those um, those parameterizations are based on uh, processes that we know that we can go and measure. So for instance, you know, we have uh, people that spend uh, the winters and summers in the Arctic to assess how uh, the changes in radiative flux cause melting in the ice, how it refreezes, what the melt ponds do, how deep the melt ponds are, what color they are, what uh, albedo they have. And we encapsulate uh, those uh, uh, pieces of evidence, those process-based pieces of evidence um, in code that we the, that we then join up uh, to uh, to build a, a, a climate model. Uh, but then those climate models, they need to be calibrated to the real world. Uh, and so we're right now using uh, machine learning techniques and large perturbed parameter ensembles to, uh, to try and understand how sensitive the model is to some of those free parameters that we're, that we're not quite sure what they are. Uh, and then we choose parameter sets that maximize the skill of the model in representing the modern day climate. Um, and uh, then the models get evaluated, you know, how well do they match the global patterns of radiation, the global patterns of cloud, rainfall, temperature, ozone. Um, and when we find errors, when we find issues, we start all over again. We update the inputs, we update the parameters, we retune the model, we reevaluate these things, and it goes around and around. Um, these models are never finished, uh, which is, I guess, good for my career prospects, uh, not so great for the uh, for, for the planet, uh, but they are skillful. And I'll give you some demonstrations of that uh, in a second. So how do we attribute these changes, right? So I mentioned earlier on that uh, the fingerprint of carbon dioxide changes in the atmosphere was this stratospheric cooling, tropospheric warming. Um, we can continue to look at that, right? So here is a stratospheric temperatures uh, for the models and for the observations. And what we've done here is we've pulled out each of the different things that have been changing, uh, the anthropogenic things and the natural things. So the, the volcanoes and the sun, uh, the anthropogenic uh, changes uh, involve uh, deforestation, uh, changes in atmospheric pollution and aerosols, um, ozone changes from, uh, from either you know, precursor gases that are increasing ozone in the troposphere or um, chlorinated uh, compounds that are decreasing ozone in the stratosphere. Um, and so this is, a, this is a measure of stratospheric temperatures uh, from, uh, from the 19th century in the models. And you can see the black dots are where we have satellite estimates of these stratospheric temperatures. And you can see that the, that the models match what's going on uh, in terms of the trends, but all of the trends are related to anthropogenic changes. Like the, the, the natural changes on their own, the solar, the um, volcanoes, the small amount of orbital forcing don't make, uh, uh, don't match the trends that we're seeing in the stratosphere in this particular figure. Now we can, we can go further. We can say, well, 
What about the mid troposphere, lower down, like, you know, where other things are happening, where the balance is different. And again, all of the trends that we're seeing in the model and uh, through those different uh, attribution tests, there all of the trends are due to the anthropogenic uh, effects. Uh, for the mid troposphere or for the lower troposphere, we have two competing effects, the, the aerosols, which have led to a slight cooling, and then the greenhouse gases uh, dominantly, which, have, uh, which on their own would have led to more warming than we've seen. Uh, but when you combine all of those things and you combine uh, with the natural changes as well, uh, we end up with a very good match for what has been happening in the real world. Um, we can go to the surface, right? So this is where we live. This is where the attribution perhaps makes more difference. And again, the answer is very clear. All of the trends in surface air temperatures are due to anthropogenic forcings. Um, we can look at the Arctic and we can say, OK, well, why is the sea ice disappearing? And again, it's the same answer. All of the trends in the Arctic sea ice are due to our activities, right? Um, there's a little bit of a wiggle for, for internal variability, you know, whether whether we have Enzos or La Niñas or, you know, various uh, various uh, different weather states. Uh, but the uh, the best estimate uh, for what's causing the trends from the top of the stratosphere to the bottom of the ocean is anthropogenic forces. We can see these changes from space directly, right? So, um, I, and those processes that are important, we can see those processes, we can measure those processes, we can use those processes to inform the models. And then when you combine the models and the observations, that what you conclude, what you infer, is that all of the current long-term trends are anthropogenic. The pattern of change that we see is, again, something that we can predict. If you look at how we predicted uh, what was going to happen to uh, surface temperatures, uh, what we see is, uh, is, is this pattern, right? So uh, this is... Uh, uh, this is a graph that, we, that I just I put together um, because Earth Day was, uh, was not so long ago. Um, uh, and this is the change that we've had since 1970. So we've seen uh, more warming over land than over the ocean. We've seen more warming in the north than in the south. And most of the warming, the, the, the part of the planet that's warming uh, fastest uh, is very clearly uh, the, uh, the Arctic. And this is the pattern that was predicted by models uh, that were run, the first models, uh, the first complicated GCM models that were run uh, in the 1980s. That was it. <laughs> um, I did not think it was going to be quite so short. Uh, I apologize. I thought I had more slides in here. <laughs> um, but I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to go through uh, some more of the issues um, uh, or just talk straight to the, uh, the Q&A. Um, I apologize. I thought that this was the longer slides. No, no, no worries. So uh, I think we can answer some questions or if you want yes. to show additional slides, that's fine. Too. Um, no, uh, let's, uh, let's let's go to the questions. And if there are additional um, issues, then I'll uh, I'll pull up some slides that are related to that. OK, so uh, the first one is from Art Bradley. In a recent EC talk, the speaker discussed in recent SPE and briefly showed the result of a climate model simulation. We showed very large temperature anomalies. So in right. the past, there were much bigger SPEs. Are there model simulations that examine those effects? Yes. So that's that's a that's a great uh, that's a great example. So um, uh, the SPE solar um, solar energetic particles, I, I, SEPs, right? Oh, I think that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, coronal yes. mass, yeah. yeah, right, coronal mass ejections impacting uh, the upper stratosphere. So, uh, yes, yeah, so these have uh, impacts, um, uh, temperature impacts. They have very high up in the atmosphere. So, obviously, you see it in the thermosphere and, uh, and maybe the mesosphere. Uh, chemical impacts, you see um, changes in, uh, in uh, NOx particles, which are active uh, mainly in the mesosphere, which kind of feeds down to the stratosphere. You don't see uh, changes in the troposphere. 
there, right? So, so these are very much uh, upper atmosphere uh, effects. Uh, they're not, um, uh, they're not uh, uh, negligible for the, for the overall climate. And particularly if we have uh, modulation of these events over the solar cycle, they can impact the magnitude of the solar cycle effects um, as, uh, as, as you go forward. Um, but uh, but we are including those in our models of uh, solar cycle impacts on the climate, um, and uh, and yes, I mean we we do anticipate that uh, uh, we we can do that. Yes. So the next question from Marco Mistri is: Are the model realizations same for all four simulations in the plot? Arctic ice, uh, Earth temperature, stratosphere. Uh, yes, so they're the same. Uh, it's the same model, and we're just looking at different diagnostics of those things. Um, it's not one model run. There are for each of the uh, for each of the test cases, it's an ensemble of models, either five or ten different um, realizations. Those are averaged together uh, to uh, pull out the forced signal uh, without so much internal variability uh, being visible. But uh, uh, yeah, so there's so that in those graphs. Uh, what you're seeing, you know, there's like, uh, you know, eight different uh, sets of experiments, uh, five to 10 ensemble members for each of them, 150 years or so of model runs. And so you, you're condensing a huge amount of data into a very small, uh, into a very small plot. So. So next question, uh, also, also wondering if we should expect any further insights, say from perhaps the next round of CMIP. If they plan oh yeah, so uh, CMIP, uh, CMIP is the coupled model into comparison project. Um, uh, these are done periodically to uh, benchmark uh, the models that are being developed around the world. So uh, right now there are nearly 40 modeling groups that submit to this. Uh, among those modeling groups, they have multiple models. So you have like 50 to 60 uh, individual models that are being uh, tested through this. Uh, we use these uh, these CIMIT projects uh, to uh, look at what's robust across all of those models um, and then look to see where they where they are not so robust um, uh, and where there is, uh, you know, uh, structural uncertainty that we can uh, that we can look into. Um, and uh, those are done uh, mainly to inform the IPCC process, which is, as, as many of you probably know, is an every uh, five to seven years, maybe seven to eight years type of process where uh, we, the, the, the scientific community is asked by uh, the intergovernmental panel uh, on climate change to, to tell them what's happening um, or, or to update their understanding of uh, what, the, uh, what the impacts of climate change are uh, and where the, where the uncertainties uh, still lie. Uh, so as we've uh, as we've progressed uh, with those, oh, let me let, let, let me let me find let me I okay, let me let me let me share with you one uh, since we're talking about this. Um, let me share with you a couple of more slides. Um, all right, so. Zoom com zoom. Share this. Um, okay, so uh, these these are old model projections, uh, kind of pre the CMIP days. Um, and as you can see, you know, even the projections in the 1980s have actually lined up quite nicely with uh, what has happened uh, subsequently. Um, and then uh, this uh, this graph here labeled uh, the 2000s, uh, those are models that were from the CMIP three uh, phase. So that they were they were models that were run uh, in in the early 2000s and so the forecasts that they've made have actually been uh, extremely um uh extremely um uh, uh prescient uh somewhat surprisingly um and then uh cmip 5 which was a few years later uh the the band there the gray bands you're seeing is is the ensemble uh of the um uh, of the models uh, going forward um and again those have been uh relatively uh successful at predicting uh what's going to happen um something a little bit odd happened in cmip 6 um where 
the increase of um, uh, this is perhaps a little technical for this audience, but anyway, so uh, one of the key metrics in uh, these climate simulations is what's called the um, effective or the, the equilibrium climate sensitivity. What, what would happen uh, to the model climate if we doubled the amount of carbon dioxide? Um, and that ha has been uh, historically uh, kind of, we've thought that it's between around two and 4.5. Um, uh, we have uh, observational constraints on that number from from paleoclimate, from changes in the in the uh, in the historical period, uh, our understanding of of, of processes, um, and so our assessment of that uh, number is is that now we think it's somewhere between uh, two point five and four degrees. That so that's. Uh, you know, and the best estimate is around three degrees uh, Celsius for a doubling of carbon dioxide. Uh, but in the CMIP-6 models, um, uh, you can see that there were a lot of models uh, kind of uh, out here past 4.5 uh, that were giving climate sensitivities that were uh, uh, much larger than we think are realistic. Um, and uh, trying to work out uh, why those models did that, uh, what that means for how you compare these models to the real world um, is uh, very much an ongoing uh, issue. It turns out that if you uh, if you look at those models, uh, the, the, uh, the ones that have too high a kind of sensitivity, uh, they would cause the match to the, uh, to, to the hindcast or the match to the observational temperatures uh, to be uh, already a little awry. Uh, and by the time you get out to some of the predicted changes, uh, they would be uh, quite a ways off. And so uh, we have to like, look at these models quite critically uh, when we're using them to predict what's going to happen. Uh, so we're just about, we're, we're starting discussions right now on whether uh, and how uh, we should progress with the, with the next round of CMIP. And it's something that, um, uh, that people are, uh, are very, uh, are very um, engaged in right now. Thank you. Next question is from Javier Calbe. So is the, oops, uh, is the Earth energy budget incoming solar versus outgoing thermal mm -hmm. well understood? And if not, what space instruments are needed? That's a great, great question. Yes. Um, so uh, the uh, the Earth's energy, but oh, you know, like since I'm here, I'm going to give you another picture as well. Yeah. Um, uh, I well, I can't, I can't, I can't find it. Um, I, so uh, we know that the. Uh, uh, the models predicted that there would be an energy imbalance because of the increases in carbon dioxide, right? So we, so we predicted from, from the 1980s onwards that uh, we would have more energy coming in than leaving, um, and that that energy imbalance would show up first and foremost uh, in the ocean heat content uh, estimates. And so uh, as our ability to put together all of the data from the whole ocean uh, has, has improved through digitization, through better observations, through the Argo float network, uh, what we have seen is that has become uh, totally evident. So we have seen um, increases in the ocean heat content uh, that uh, match what the models were predicting for what that should be doing. Um, there's a twist though, right? Uh, and it turns out that while the models uh, predicted that we would see an increasing imbalance as the uh, carbon dioxide levels um, uh, increase, uh, we now have uh, 20 years of data from the series measurements, right? So these are uh, on uh, 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 Terra and Aqua, uh, and they have been tracking since 2000 uh, the, uh, the the changes in both the short wave and the long wave at the top of the atmosphere. And what those records show is that there is indeed an increasing um, uh, trend in the uh, in the energy. Uh, imbalance, right? So uh, compared to 2000 in 2022, uh, we are we are ex we are uh, drawing in more uh, energy. Um, uh, but it also gives a breakdown uh, between uh, short wave and long wave. Uh, effects. And it turns out that most of the changes that we're seeing now are in the short wave uh, and not in the long wave. And that 
gives us some insight into uh, perhaps the, the, the specific causes of what's going on. And, and those involve uh, what's happening to aerosols. So as aerosols decrease, there are shortwave forcing. So uh, the air is getting cleaner. And so that allows for more shortwave to come in. So that's part of the, uh, uh, that's part of the answer. Um, the uh, long wave effects uh, in the net are quite small because you have balances between uh, changes in the clear sky radiated forcing from, from carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases, but then you also have uh, cloud feedbacks that, and water vapor feedbacks that are affecting the long wave uh, change. Uh, but when you put it all together, um, it looks like the models don't quite match the, the short wave and long wave breakdown of the net change uh, it, that's being observed from Ceres. Uh, and we are uh, putting together a, uh, a new project called Ceres MIP uh, that is really going to be laser focused on exactly uh, what's happening there. So uh, we're trying to uh, make sure that all of our estimates of the aerosols are, are updated to the uh, the best estimates over the, over this time period. Uh, the, our chain, the changes in the ocean are updated to the best estimates uh, that, uh, that we end up uh, looking at all the different models. Uh, so the efforts that we've, that we've done so far are a little bit um, imperfect uh, because the, the last CMIP round uh, only used observations to 2014 and then had extrapola, you know, scenarios based on that. So they didn't include things like the change in aerosols because of the COVID restrictions. It didn't include things like uh, the impacts of wildfires in Australia and it, and it didn't have the uh, big El Ninos uh, in 2015, 2016 um, and, the, and, and in 2020 as well. So, so there's, there's uh, what we have at hand uh, makes it tricky to fully explain what the series data is uh, has shown, uh, but we're hoping to have um, a, a new set of model runs uh, to compare and to attribute those changes uh, shortly. There may still be a problem, um, uh, in which case uh, the series data might be pointing to uh, issues with cloud feedbacks that we have not yet um, uh, addressed, uh, or it could be related to to something else. So, so that's very much a um, uh, a, uh, a target for current research. Thank you. So is the water vapor in the stratosphere well measured from space? Um, it is measured from space. Uh, um, the microwave limb sounders have been tracking uh, water vapor. Uh, we have uh, some of the hyperspectral stuff has been tracking uh, water vapor. Um, we know uh, that it has increased over time. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. So one is there's an increased amount of oxidation from uh, methane. So methane has been increasing. And so uh, most of the methane is being oxidized in the stratosphere. That's a big source of stratospheric water vapor. So higher methane concentrations lead to more uh, hydrolysis uh, of, of methane in the stratosphere. And so that's, that's increasing uh, the kind of mid to upper tropospheric uh, water vapor things. Uh, we can see uh, that changes in the temperature at the tropopause uh, are modulating uh, changes in water vapor coming up through uh, the, the tropics. Uh, and we can see that we can see that on a on a seasonal basis that uh, this, this water vapor tape recorder that kind of uh, moves up uh, through the tropics. Uh, and we can see that that has been uh, leading to increases in, in water vapor as well. Um, I, we saw, for instance, the uh, the Hunga Tonga eruption, uh, you know, in, uh, in early 21, uh, increased the total amount of stratospheric water vapor by about 10% on its own. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we are tracking now that, that plume of increased water vapor that, that's directly from that one uh, volcanic eruption. Uh, so I think that uh, we have uh, we have real issues with continuity going forward, right? So as you're probably aware, uh, Terra um, and Aqua are uh, now in drifting orbits. They've run out of fuel for um, orbit corrections. Uh, NASA is, uh, I mean, right now trying to work out what to do with that. You know, what can be continued, uh, what new science can be done and what science uh, is going to be um, uh, terminated and uh, uh, and it, and some some of those instruments will be turned off uh, and some of them will be maintained and uh, so it's very uh, it's very hard to know what's going to be going on there but then but then once they go 
you know, we like the NASA um, A train uh, really kind of falls apart without that. Um, and so uh, we have we are, I think, uh, going to have to rely on uh, some of the uh, the European missions. Um, and, uh, and and we're trying very hard to get the next uh, the next phase of NASA's uh, contribution to this uh, off the drawing board. Uh, I think that there will be gaps. Um, and I think that that's going to be problematic uh, for uh, maintaining uh, climate records, uh, continuous climate records going forward. Um, that's something that I think the community is very concerned about and, and rightly so. Yeah, that was exactly you are answered already the next question. That sh should we be worried about the end life of the A-train satellites? Monitoring of the stratosphere well, will be more difficult. I mean, worry. I don't know if worry is the right would i mean uh, obviously satellites don't last forever they run out of fuel the set the the instruments de degrade um uh, do we have a continuity issue yes yes we do uh I, are there ways around some of those issues uh, yes, you know we have we have the uh, the MPO satellites, we have the Sentinel satellites. You know we have uh, we have some ways of getting around that. So for the 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 Earth's energy imbalance uh, measurements will continue um, even uh, past uh, Terra and Aqua. Uh, but uh, you know the 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 solar solar irradiance measurements. You know we have we have backups uh, on the uh, on the on the uh, on the space station. Uh, so so uh, we we have like. For certain things, we have uh, continuity, but uh, but but for other things, we're we're not we're going to lose that. And uh, yes, that I mean that that is of of concern. So another question from Salah was: I was expecting some error bars, confidence ranges in the time series plot. What is the level of confidence we should expect? Um, I'm not sure which uh, which which ones you 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 think. Uh, um, are particularly uncertain, but uh, but for instance, the surface temperatures, uh, the uh, the error bar on on any individual year is around 0 0.05 uh, Celsius, um, and the uh, the uncertainty in the trends uh, is about point point one over the over the 120 year uh, period. So uh, and there are no there are no uncertainties that uh, uh, that undermine any of the conclusions that are being made. Excellent. So we have a lot of questions. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Like, you know, a lot like, of I, interest. I, I, this is great. I, uh, this is great. <laughs> my presentation was surprisingly short. So uh, <laughs> it's okay. Let's, let's, so, let's so let's get away. So Michael Mystery, thank you, Gavin, for answering the previous questions. If I may ask another, you explained the attribution of long-term changes in temperature and sea ice very well. These are from different simulation accounting for natural and anthropogenic forcing. Could we apply a similar technique when attributing climate change to weather extremes, such as yeah. the current heat waves in Spain and India, or would statistical modeling like extreme value theory be suited, better suited for that? So uh, the extreme value, uh, like just, just looking at the data, um, it's very hard. You know, you have you have something that uh, that, that looks like it's a it's a, an unprecedented event. Um, is that an unprecedented event that would have happened one every ten thousand years, one every thousand years, one every hundred years? We just don't have, you know, enough records to be able to distinguish those things just from the data alone. Uh, but what we can do is uh, look at uh, the situation, the synoptic situation that, 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 that we see, we can look at these models um, in a statistical sense. Uh, and so we can start with that, right? So we look at the models in a statistical sense and we say, uh, are they producing uh, more and, and, and more intense uh, heat waves? And the answer is yes. Um, uh, even, even at, even at the, 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 the tails. And with the model, you know, we can run it for tens of thousands of years. Uh, and so we can get a much uh, clearer view of what the model thinks the tail distribution is going to change uh, with uh, as a function of, uh, of, of increasing temperature. And we, and we see that. So we see uh, that the, the, the tails uh, of the heat wave statistics uh, become uh, more intense and more frequent. Uh, we see that the uh, rainfall intensity becomes uh, more intense and more frequent. Uh, we see that the impacts of drought on soil moisture become uh, more uh, more intense. Uh, and so uh, those come out of 
the models. And then we can do single event attribution, which uh, takes the particular situation of any of any particular event that you, that you care about, whether it's uh, the temperatures in India uh, today or Pakistan a couple of years ago, or the European heat wave in 2003, or the Pacific Northwest heat wave in uh, 2021. Uh, and we can then say, okay, well, let's take, let's take a model like today. How often does that happen? And then we say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's roll this back to the 19th century, right? Let's, let's have oceans be a degree colder. Uh, and then how often does that happen there? And so a lot of the uh, attributions that you've heard about with respect to these individual events are based on the ratio of uh, extremes in those two circumstances, right? So in a cold pre-industrial world and then in a warm modern uh, world. And, and, and what you find is uh, quite often that the ratios uh, of uh, the likelihood of such an event um, are, are massively favor uh, the uh, uh, not quite a causal uh, statement, but a uh, an attribute, a fractional attribution statement that goes along the lines of, you know, this is something that is now happening five times more uh, often uh, than it would have done in the pre-industrial, 10 times more often, 100 times more often. Um, and that and that's true even for very, very rare events that uh, that even today might be a one in 500 year event. Uh, that one in 500 year event now might have been a one in a thousand or two thousand or five thousand year event um, previously, which effectively means it would it was very unlikely to have ever been seen before. And so we're in a we're in a a period now where uh, we are seeing things that have never been seen by human civilization uh, because they were vanishingly rare um, occurrences, perhaps not totally impossible, but vanishingly rare um, occurrences uh, in uh, in the prior climate, uh, but now are happening. Uh, so, you know, if anybody is, is in the UK, you know, we had a we had 40 degree uh, days last last summer in the UK that has never been seen uh, before and uh, looks to have been uh, effectively something that was unprecedented in the prior climate. Absolutely. So uh, we have a question from Ralph Kahn. What measurements do you think would be most important to reduce the current uncertainties in climate forcing? Uh, so my, uh, my, my stock answer to this is better understanding of uh, aerosols and uh, atmospheric composition. Uh, right now, we know how much aerosol there is in the whole column of the atmosphere, but we don't know uh, very well what it's made of or how it's mixed. Um, so we, we don't have, you know, how much sea salt there is, how much dust, how much um, uh, sulfate, how much nitrate, how much organic carbon, uh, how much uh, other, other things that, that are in there. Um, and we don't have those separated out. And if you look at the models, and if you look at the models who have to predict what is in the air, what that composition is, uh, their different estimates of that balance uh, is, 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 is quite significant. And that has a direct impact uh, both on uh, how they think the planet has warmed uh, since, the, uh, since the 1940s, uh, but also how uh, quickly uh, the, the changes in aerosols are going to impact the, the, uh, the temperature changes uh, going forward as hopefully we, we reduce the amount of air pollution. Uh, and so those, um, uh, those measurements are absolutely crucial. We're going to have um, uh, a, a, a launch uh, in the early next year of the PACE mission, uh, which will be looking uh, at ocean color and at aerosols uh, with a polarimeter uh, that we anticipate uh, will uh, be able to, uh, to really reduce the uncertainties uh, in the aerosol composition. Uh, and that will have, uh, I think, a, a knock-on effect uh, both in uh, the uncertainty of, of the future temperatures, but also in the uh, in the hindcasts of what's happened uh, in, in the past. Thank you. So we have another question from Hendrik Lindt. How safe and well-funded are the climate-related Earth observation programs of NASA regarding mm -hmm. short-term decisions in the political landscape in the USA? Remembering that the previous administration at the beginning of the 40 years planned to strongly defend such program in favor of Moon Mars exploration. Right. Uh, so this is a little bit above my pay grade. Um, so I don't have any um, 
like direct uh, information here, but I, but I can tell you uh, that the uh, that that in in NASA there is a total commitment to the next generation of Earth observing systems. Uh, but what exactly they will look like and what we can afford um, is not purely a NASA decision. So uh, you know we uh, we don't write our own budgets. Uh, it's uh, Congress that writes the budget um, and. The presidents uh, and, and, you know, recent presidents uh, have had very different ideas about what NASA should be doing and how they should be uh, spending their money. Uh, but it turns out that the uh, the congressional budget um, process uh, is is a much more conservative uh, with a small C, uh, much more conservative uh, 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 process um, and our uh, our overall budget uh, uh, has been. Um, uh, has been protected from from various enthusiasms from different administrations, and so so the overall budget uh, has been increasing uh, even for Earth science uh, throughout uh, this entire time. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know these are these are big missions and they are ambitious programs, and so uh, it's uh, it's it's you know it's it's going to take support from a broad swath of uh, Congress uh, to get these to be fully funded uh, in, a, in a timely manner. And uh, uh, I, hope that, I hope that that happens, but I, I cannot guarantee that that will happen. So a question from Socono. You made a clear case that anthropogenic influence is the cause of climate change. When yes. I talk to climate deniers, they usually point to the little ice age, saying we're coming out of it. I try to explain the best I can that that wasn't global, but I don't get anywhere. What would right. you suggest for this conversation? I, I would suggest not having those conversations. Um, so you know, some some people like you can you can talk you can show them the science you can show them the evidence and they're not going to be swayed because what they can what they're uh, what they're upset about is not any of those things. It's it's what they think that ongoing climate change means for policy and uh and until you get to you know why it is that they uh find our conclusions unpalatable you're not going to be able to sway them with with evidence and so i uh, the better kind of conversation to have is not um a tit for tat uh you know paleo climate record uh showing the little ice age or not um uh but it's rather you know what 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 are the things that you care about in going into the future like why you know i uh, you know do you not care about the coasts do you not care about infrastructure do you not care about people or uh, ecosystems and sometimes they don't care <laughs> uh, in which point there's very little there's very little uh, point in continuing um so uh, you know i mean most of those discussions are no longer in good faith i mean i think you know, 20 years ago, it was it was an interesting thing. But like 20 years, uh, we've seen another increase of like, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. Right. So, you know, when people were arguing, you know, in the 1980s uh, about whether the medieval warm period was uh, was warmer or cooler than the 1980s, it's moot. Right. It's much warmer now. Right. Because we've warmed up another half a degree since then. Right. We're not. You know, like a lot of these, a lot of these discussions, uh, you know, with it, were interesting once and they're no longer interesting. Um, and so they're 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 kind of zombie arguments that are just uh, reanimated by people's uh, unwillingness to deal with the political consequences of what we found. Thank you. So we have a question from Alessandra Conversi. Thanks for the talk. How much percentage is the difference between measures and model prediction in Earth balance? And in relation to aerosols, that's a good question. I don't think I can quite. Um, I don't think I can quite show. Let, let me let me see if I can find. I got one figure that is that is uh, that is relevant to that. Okay, let's try and share that. This is like this is science in action, people. There we go. Okay, can you uh, can you see that? Um, so uh, the uh, so what we're looking at here is the uh, net 
earth imbalance at the top of the atmosphere um, in the short wave and in the long wave, right? So at the bottom is the short wave you know, the, and the upside is the long wave. Uh, the black dot, uh, the black square that you see is the uh, series data. Um, uh, and this is the increase in, in forcing, the, the increase in the imbalance. So it's the acceleration. Um, uh, the black uh, square is the, uh, is the series data. Uh, that uh, up to uh, 2022, um, and you can see that uh, the short wave changes um, are uh, quite extreme relative to the models. So the models, uh, these are a whole suite of, uh, of, of different uh, GIS configurations from, from our modeling system. Uh, each one of the round dots is uh, is an individual run, uh, so there's there's some noise in there because of the internal variability, um, uh, and the net imbalance uh, is that straight line that's going down uh, the middle. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, a number of the model runs uh, are, are well within the uncertainty of what the net imbalance uh, is, uh, but they don't match the short wave and long wave uh, components individually. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can make an argument that, that some of them do uh, approach that, and, and those are ones with the most sophisticated aerosol models. Um, uh, but, but these aren't with observed aerosols past 2014. Uh, and so we, uh, we, ha we, have, um, uh, we have some uncertainty there. So, so the question, uh, the question is, you know, what's the percent uh, error? Um, so you can see that, you know, we're certain model runs will get to like 95% of the, uh, of the net imbalance, uh, that's, that's inferred the net imbalance change that's inferred, uh, from series. Uh, but if you look at our estimate of what the short wave, uh, is, you know, we're, we're, we're managing to match, you know, maybe, you know, maybe just over 50% of that. And so uh, that's that's a significant uh, gap. Um, and it could be we're not quite comparing like with like. Uh, so it's not clear where the uh, where the error is uh, at this point. I mean, and it may be, you know, that there are some um, un, unadjusted uh, non-climatic issues with the series data as well, you know, but, but, but the series data seem to match the in-situ data quite well. So uh, we don't think it's that, um, but... Uh, uh, but it may well be that we've been underestimating uh, how much the aerosols have been decreasing in the uh, in in the last uh, few years. Even uh, most most of the discrepancy uh, starts to occur uh, in around 2015 and onwards. Uh, up until then, they kind of line up quite nicely. So so it's really only in the last six, seven, eight years that uh, that things have changed uh, and that things don't quite line up. Thank you. We have a question from Claude Nicolier. So what is the physical chemical reason for stratospheric cooling? The ozone layer is about 50 kilometers altitude and you show the significant cooling at that altitude. Mm -hmm. What influence does this cooling have on the ozone processes at 50 kilometers? Um, okay, so the uh, the physical reason for stratospheric cooling is that uh, the stratosphere really only absorbs long wave radiation in some very narrow bands associated with ozone and carbon dioxide. Uh, uh, as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, most of the the en most of the energy uh, in the carbon dioxide bands is now being absorbed in the um, uh, in the in the troposphere, so there's less of that energy moving up to be absorbed by the atmosphere. And as carbon dioxide increases, it becomes a, a better emitter as well as a better absorber. And so uh, anywhere uh, effectively above the tropopause, uh, the stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere going up, um, uh, you're seeing uh, less energy being absorbed in the CO2 bands, and you're seeing more energy being emitted. Those two things cause a net cooling uh, pretty much anywhere above the tropopause. So um, uh, that's uh, so it, it's it's not really related to the ozone uh, or anything, and it happens you know even when there isn't any ozone. Um, uh, but the impact on the ozone um, is that. Uh, you okay? Let me get this right. This is like I, 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 as I, when I venture into atmospheric chemistry, I always I always have to like double check that I'm doing the right thing. Um, so uh, cooling uh, temperatures in in the stratosphere reduce the um, uh, the, uh, the the reaction rates uh, for various 
uh, reactions. And so you have you have both um, you have photolysis uh, that that doesn't really change, but then you have um, uh, then you have uh, some uh, ozone changes. And I'm not you know what I'm 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 not gonna I'm not gonna definitively say whether it's less or more ozone uh, in the, in the mean. Uh, because I'm going to get it wrong, and then that's just going to be embarrassing. So, uh, so I will, I will, I will, I will go back and check on that. Uh, it's not a huge effect. Um, uh, the the biggest uh, cause of changes in ozone uh, is the increases in uh, chlorinated compounds, uh, mainly CFCs um, and uh, and some bromide uh, species uh, over over that time, and that's that's that caused the. Uh, the, the, the decrease in uh, ozone from the kind of 1980s on and the ozone hole. So. Thank you. So we have a question from Uli Kohler from the DLR. If you have a wish for a space mission in the near future, what kind of measurement should this mission make? <laughs> uh, Yeah, I, you know, uh, we've been wishing for an aerosol mission for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we've had multiple uh, multi country efforts to do this and, uh, and we and it hasn't stuck. Uh, and so the wish for this uh, is long standing and we have our fingers crossed that pace is going to pick up the pace on this. Um, uh, and we hope that, uh, that that will do it. So, so that's, that's really my, uh, my wish. Yeah. We have a question on if we could remove CO2 from the atmosphere, what level would be an appropriate target for the future? This is from our Bradley. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, it, Jim Hansen, my predecessor, uh, wrote a paper arguing for 350 uh, ppm. Um, I, I, you know, the arguments for this are a little bit, uh, um, you know, value based. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be a terrible uh, thing. Uh, but the problem is that we we are not able to remove carbon at that scale um, uh, and, and put it somewhere. Uh, where it won't interact with the atmosphere anymore. Uh, I'm I'm paying attention to the uh, carbon removal uh, efforts uh, that are ongoing, whether it's it's ocean based or uh, biomass based or direct air capture. Um, but uh, but none of these things uh, as yet uh, look capable of being uh, scaled to to anything like um, um, not not even like cancelling out what we're putting into the atmosphere, let alone uh, reducing it to, uh, to a number below uh, where we are now. We are approaching the end. There's two more questions. Do you really think the satellites alone can provide the needed detail about aerosol microphysical properties? Uh, and similarly, oh, right. would satellite observation be adequate to constrain uncertainties in aerosol cloud interaction for this application? Okay, well, that that's absolutely the case. Um, uh, yes, th th it's not sufficient just to know uh, what what kind of aerosols there are. Uh, we need process based um, efforts uh, that would involve, you know, in situ lab based uh, work. We'd, I mean, the lab based stuff is is happening, but we don't have large enough cloud chambers to really be able to see the full uh, life cycle of these things without uh, without crashing into the sides. Um, but we, uh, we 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 definitely need uh, more. Uh, uh, efforts uh, to to do that. Uh, some of the designs for the Earth observing system uh, have cloud aerosol interactions as a as a prime target. Um, uh, but like I said, that's still very much um, a, a project in flux. So it's 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 conceivable that we'll get better remote sensing data from that. But uh, uh, but it may well be that we we continue to have a great deal of uncertainty associated with aerosol cloud interactions. One other question from Thierry Dudoc de Vic. What are the observable who's monitoring by a large constellation of small nanosats with lower meteorology quality but programmatically more flexible could provide added value over one single large spacecraft? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And and we're very much in into the era of large constellations of small sats. Um, uh, the miniaturization of, of things like spectrography um, uh, and uh, uh, 
and and um, you know IR uh, you know hyperspectral stuff uh, means that we can we we can be doing uh, a lot with a constellation of lower quality uh, satellites. Um, you know one of one of the the things that we have you know with the polar orbiting satellite you know we're we're not looking at the whole globe at the same time. And so a network of uh, small sats um, could give a, a, a very uh, interesting, uh, different perspective on, on that. So I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'd be very keen on uh, exploring those things. Uh, and then, you know, since they're much cheaper, you can throw lots of them into space at once and it doesn't matter that they don't last for very long. Uh, but we really need to, um, uh, you know, they, they, these things still need to be grounded with, you know, the, the high precision stuff. But but there's a lot of, you know, I, I think we're, we have a lot more flexibility now in designing new missions than uh, we had, uh, say, 20 years ago. And and I think, it, I think it's quite clear that NASA hasn't quite caught up with that increase in flexibility. Um, but, but there's certainly a, a willingness to look at that. And the final question, solar activity entered the ground solar minimum. Mm -hmm. We see the decrease of terrestrial temperature all over the world. How is this included in your models? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not so sure about the whole grand solar minima thing. Um, the, this, uh, this solar cycle doesn't seem to be following that. Um, uh, and the predictions of grand solar minima are really, uh, you know, the statistical in nature, they're not really process based and so, I'm happy to, to to see what's going to happen, but the but the notion that uh, uh, that the grand solar minima are suddenly going to cancel out all of the increases because of greenhouse gases and 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 the like, uh, there's no evidence for that. So um, I, I don't think it's going to be a very large uh, or very important thing uh, for climate at the surface. It's obviously going to be very interesting for. Uh, heliophysics, it, it would obviously be very interesting for, you know, some things that are going on in the stratosphere and the thermosphere, uh, but uh, as a climate change driver, uh, it's not really uh, up there with, uh, with anything else. Thank you. This was a very, very lively question and answer. So, so Gavin, yeah, I think you have the floor for one last parting message. Do you think that people are scared enough about what's happening? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think people being scared is really the, the, the right thing. I mean, people should be concerned and people should be uh, understanding, you know, what's driving the changes now and, and using that to inform uh, what's uh, going to be happening. Uh, what, one of the things that's very odd for me personally is that, you know, as, as a beginning scientist, I, I was, you know, very much kind of, embedded with the idea that you know uh, you know if we if we if we see something in the universe and we encapsulate it in our theories and then we use those theories to make successful predictions that we should be happy that we should be glad that the scientific process worked that we should take pride in uh, the fact that we could predict what 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 was previously unpredictable uh, but the problem with that is that when you're predicting things that you don't actually want to be true there's a there's a there's a there's a dichotomy, right? Because me as a scientist, I'm thinking, yay, we predicted that the temperatures were going to rise, and then me as a citizen is saying, like, uh, we predicted the temperatures were going to rise, and Stuart Rowland uh, put it very well. Uh, he he won the Nobel Prize for um, uh, the chemistry of uh, ozone depletion uh, that they elucidated in the 1970s. And he said many years later, what's the point in having made a science good enough to make predictions if all you're going to do is sit around and wait for them to come true? And we are all in this boat now. We don't want to sit around and wait for our predictions to come true. We don't want them to come true. We understand what would be needed to have that not happen. And I think we are ethically um, beholden uh, to try and prevent our predictions from coming true. So hopefully we can find some consensus on that. And on this note, I think we thank you again for a very, very lively and interesting conversation. So honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Antonella. It was a, it was a great pleasure to do it. Thank you.